Well, welcome everybody uh, to the Heritage Foundation. I trust that everybody has silenced their phones. My name is John Malcolm. I'm the Vice President uh, of the Institute for Constitutional Government and Director of the Mies Legal Center here at the Heritage uh, Foundation. We are on a, a very tight schedule today because uh, Senator Graham has a meeting at 1 o'clock with the President, uh, so I will be keeping my introductory remarks. At the White House, my, not with him. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and my speaker introductions. <laughs> Very short indeed, indeed way shorter uh, than either one of these gentlemen deserves. Uh, so we are here today to hear about the priorities of the Senate and House Judiciary Committees for the 116th Congress. Uh, for the outside casual observer, it would seem that the sole priority of one of these committees is to confirm judges, and that the sole priority of the other is to issue subpoenas. Uh, but I'm sure that there may be more to it than that. We are first going to hear from Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina who, as I say, currently serves as the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. He has served in the Senate since 2002. Uh, prior to that, he was in the House of Representatives, where he was first elected to that body in 1994. He has a law degree from the University of South Carolina, and until his retirement, he had served in the United States Air Force for 33 years, attaining the rank of colonel. Then we will hear from Congressman Doug Collins, who is the ranking member of the House Judiciary Committee. He has represented Georgia's 9th Congressional District since 2013. Prior to that, he served for a number of years in the Georgia legislature. He's a graduate of the John Marshall Law School and also has a Master's of Divinity from the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. And like Senator Graham, he also served in the Air Force uh, since 2002 as a chaplain and a lieutenant colonel. Senator, the floor is yours. Thank you. A lawyer chaplain. Grace in law. <laughs> <laughs> it means you're going to heaven, but it'd take you a long time to get there. Uh, <laughs> you may have to sue to get in. But uh, so thank you. So priorities. We're in the personnel business in the Senate. That's the difference between the House. Judges, more judges, and a few more. So we're going to do as many judges as we reasonably can because the openings are there, and this is one of the things that comes with winning the presidency. So I'm committed to processing as many highly qualified conservative judges at the district circuit level as possible. We're off to a very good start. The first day we reported out more judges than any time since 1981, I think it's 46 or I can't remember the number, held over from the last Congress. We work with Democrats, try to accommodate their needs where I can. The bottom line is they changed the rules for the circuit court back in 2013 to a majority. Now we um, tried to get Gorsuch through twice or three times and couldn't get 60 votes, and he's the top of anybody's list in terms of highly qualified, conservative, anybody would have picked Gorsuch, right? And the bottom line is that the majority vote is with us and it's probably not going to change and we're going to process the judges as quickly and as fastly as we can. The blue SIP process about uh, on the circuit level, I will make sure that there's consultation, but I think it's odd for the people who began changing the rules to say that, well, the blue slip process has to be honored for two senators or one senator, but not for the minority as a whole. So to expect for you to change the rules to just to require a, minor, a majority vote on the circuit court and that not affect the blue slip process is a bit odd. And in other words, in your circuit, you have a veto, but anybody else, any person, minority member anywhere else doesn't have a say is, you know, that's just not practical. Um, China. The Chinese Economic Espionage Act. Everything China. Getting people going to the universities and recruiting people against our own country. We're going to look at the immigration system regarding China. We're going to look at all the laws we can think of to make it harder for China to steal and cheat. Uh, Immigration. <clears throat> there are three things going on with our laws that attract this uh, surge of illegal immigration. Seventy percent of the illegal immigrants are coming from the Triangle countries. Diane Feinstein years ago had a law 
that said that a Chinese girl that was found in a crate could not be sent back to China because of a lot of reasons. That law has now been interpreted that if you're from Guatemala, Honduras, or El Salvador, you get here as a family uh, because you're not a contiguous country. We can't deport you like if you came from Mexico or Canada. Word is out. You make it here, you're going to stay. The Flores decision, which limits holding people to 20 days, an unaccompanied minor, big surge of 54%, 330% surge in family, illegal immigrant crossings. They're advertising in the triangle countries uh, that if you get to America as a family, you bring a child, you're never going to leave. 2% of the unaccompanied children wind up going back to their home country. If we don't change these things, then you can build a wall to the sky, and it's not going to work. So we've got to change the law. That means probably negotiating a little broader package. But ask the Border Patrol if you had to pick between a barrier and a change in the statutes I've just outlined, they would pick the statutes. If word ever got out that if you get here, you're going right back, they would stop. Having said that, you need a barrier. On the human trafficking side, we had some compelling testimony, about 7,000 that we know of. Young people are trafficked, trafficked into the country for sex exploitation, and they all virtually come across non-ports of entry because the law enforcement officials at ports of entry are trained to be on the watch for suspicious behavior. So this is where you need barriers to funnel people to the ports of entry. And the human trafficking expert said if you had real barriers, the chance of smuggling children into the country for sexual exploitation goes way down. So we'll be working on that. <clears throat> the gun control package in the House is not going anywhere in the Senate. But there is an area that I'm really concerned about. The Parkland shooting is probably the more, is an outrageous example of a common problem. Mr. Cruz did everything but take an ad out in the paper, I'm going to kill somebody. The FBI tip line was called, this guy's about to blow. The cops went out to his house. You had family members saying, this man's unstable. So red flag legislation exist in Indiana and other places. It allows the police to petition a court and the burden will be on them to prove that the person in question has become a danger to themselves and others to intervene, to not only deal with a gun issue, but try to get them some help. In the states where this has worked, suicide rates are down because the most common form of suicide is shooting. And in the Cruz case, it would have given the cops an opportunity to grab this guy before he blew. Got to be due process. Nobody can just come take your guns. But all of us who own guns, I think, owe it to ourselves in the country to make sure that in an emergency situation where somebody is clearly exhibiting violent behavior or tendencies toward it, that we can intervene and um, the rights can be restored. So I want to do it to incentivize the states, not pass a federal law, but try to incentivize states to go down this road and do it the way unique to them. Um, on the social conservative side, we're one of seven countries that allow abortion on demand in the fifth month, 20 weeks. I want to have a hearing and a vote. I want to get out of the club. You're in it with North Korea and Iran. Very seldom is it good to be in a club with them about anything. So in the fifth month of the uh, pregnancy, medical encyclopedias encourage the parents to sing to the unborn child because they can begin to associate your voice, recognize your voice. This is really a procedure. There's a reason there's only seven countries. And what I can't figure out is why we're one of them. Medical science says to save the baby's life in the 20 weeks, period. You need to provide anesthesia to the baby to operate on it because it can feel pain. So here's the logic. Roe v. Wade prohibits government action in the first trimester. Then the government will have a say after medical vi viability. 
this would create a new legal theory to protect the unborn. It would say that because the baby feels excruciating pain at this point in the birthing process, which is undeniable medical science, then there's a compelling state interest to pick, protect the child from an excruciating death. New theory, I think most of Americans will be with us. We're going to have a hearing, we're going to have a vote. Um, FISA abuse. The Carter Page situation should bother every American. The dossier, and Senator, uh, Congressman Collins has been terrific. All this stuff coming out. The work y'all did in the House is beginning to bear fruit. Mueller is going to complete his report here soon, I think. We'll see what he finds. He was allowed to do his job. Not many Democrats care to do much beyond that. That's unacceptable to me. I have supported Mueller doing his job without political interference, but I promise everybody in the country that in the Senate, we're going to have hearings about the FISA process. We're going to find out, did Mr. Orr actually tell McCabe and others that you should not rely on this dossier? It's a political product that's unreliable, and this guy's got a grudge. Did they get the warrant anyway? Did the court adequately know the source of the document? Without the document, could you have gotten the warrant? <laughs> this is a very big deal. Was the Clinton email investigation basically predetermined because if you want her to win, how can you indict her? Did they ignore a mountain of evidence about compromising classified information to get a result they wanted politically? Did they take what was apparently a molehill of, molehill of evidence against Trump to open up an investigation as an insurance policy in case he won? I don't know. But what I've heard bothers the hell out of me. We're going to get to the bottom of that the best we can. And we'll do other stuff too. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, as you've just heard, the I'm glad that the Senate is in the personnel business. We're in the more of the street fighting business. In the house. <laughs> uh, we're, is it, I don't know if you ever watched. I, I was a big fan of all the Rocky movies growing up. You remember Rocky Four? He goes to Russia, and they then they start throwing each other. It's a gutter war in Moscow. Well, it, on our side, that's where we've we've sort of adapted to. And you remember those times over there? Well, I do. It is that. Uh, I'm gonna just follow up on a few things. In our side, one for those who know me, we there is a way, and, and I was I'm so happy the chairman's over there because there's ways we. We can actually get stuff done. It's something that I've, I believe that legislating is the lost art of Washington, D.C. I believe legislators and, and congressmen and senators come up here with other agendas and legislating is, is not on there. Uh, from my perspective, last year's criminal justice reform, uh, the work that we did on that, and that was a bill that I had started and we worked with Hakeem Jeffries, worked in the Senate to get done and the, and the senator being such a great part of the Cloud Act, which we worked on together. Yeah, Cloud Act was a huge deal with data uh, privacy with our law enforcement communities. We put it in the last spending bill about this time last year, had great help over there. Those are the kind of things that we can look at. Immigration, uh, I agree completely. The, this, the, those three areas, Flores, asylum, and, and the temporary One of those, actually, with the temporary eviction, we actually complete the illegal transaction. The federal government does, because what happens is many times those kids are given to a legal, a, a resident here in the United States who may be illegal. So like a parent will oh, contract with a coyote to bring their children to the border. The coyote doesn't even have to cross the border. They just send the child across because they know. And, and the way our law is written in this is that they will actually give them to a relative or someone in the uh, country, even if they're here illegally. So in other words, we're completing the end of the transaction here. We're actually bringing the child to the parent at the end of the day. So those are things, and I agree from what I've heard from border folks as well. This is something that we uh, have got to do. Unfortunately, on our side, uh, it's less about legislation, This, at least early on. It's more about investigations, and this is what we've had to deal with. But when they actually do try to legislate, they're terribly bad at it. And I'm not just talking policy. I can disagree with someone who's liberal and I can be conservative and I can disagree about what they believe, but it's bothersome to me is when you come to the floor literally and do not know and do, just have no clue to what your legislation does. 
I called on H.R. 8, which I'm glad to know the gun bills are going nowhere. They don't need to go anywhere. Um, and I have a bill called the uh, MVP bill. It's Mass Violence Prevention Act, which incorporates a fusion center, which actually gets to the red flags and stuff that we're looking to work across uh, the aisles and have had some interest uh, from Democrats on that, which gives us some actual stuff that could have prevented parking, could have prevented these other things, instead of just making a political point. Happened in H.R. 8. H.R. 8 Actually, the uh, sponsor of HRA came to the floor, and we were our folks actually saw that it, it provided a fine of a, up to a hundred thousand dollars. And we kept saying a couple of our speakers actually said that the whip actually said that. And then uh, the sponsor of the bill uh, made it, you know, took the mic for a second and made a really a catty comment. The bill itself is only up to a thousand dollars. Well, there's only one problem. He's wrong. And so we actually pointed this out, and I had to walk them through the statute. They were basing their whole decision on the federal sentencing guidelines, which, by the way, happened in Booker, are now, are they mandatory or just advisory? They're advisory. They don't have to follow those. And when you looked at their law, when they looked at the act, actually the way the bill was written, we were right. Their counsel literally was sitting behind Mr. Nadler with, the, with a code book in his lap. I think we should do that before we get to the floor. Actually know what you're doing. And, but they, they didn't care. Basically, they said, we don't care what the fine is. We're going to pass this in. They gutted the bill by you know, not having a registry. A lot of things. H.R. 1, the big piece of legislation. Oh, it changed the world. By, can you feel it? You know, the world changed last week. We passed H.R. 1 to do all of the elections, and now dark money's out except their own dark money and, um, and others. And except there's one problem with H.R. 1. It actually is in the statute. And Zoe Lofgren, who is a, a congresswoman from California, is a very smart individual. We've worked on a lot of things. She, she knows better. But she had a 600-plus page bill given to House admin. That's where they marked this bill up, House admin. And one of the sections we found as we went through the 600-page document was that you stop because it was a drafting error and they didn't catch it. They said, if you stop anyone from voting, not anyone who has the right to vote, it's a big difference. Because saying anyone that has the, is voting, if I stop a four-year-old from voting, I have committed a felony. Literally, under H.R. 1. Hope you all take that up. You know, <laughs> this is something that we've had to deal with. And then we go into the investigations. I'm glad to hear uh, that the senator, and I banked on the senator uh, and the chairman doing this, because I'll, I'll answer three of his questions from just a moment ago. Uh, did Bruce Orr actually say that these are not verified, and I do have some concerns about them. Yes, he did. You know why? Because I released the transcript last Friday from his investigation. Did he tell them? Yes. Did they know it? Did they take it to the FISA court? Yes. Did they let the FISA court? No. No, they did not. And did it get in there and possibly was the reason it got there? Yes, because they listed it every time they re-up the, the FISA application. It was in there. Uh, Clinton probe released the Lisa Page transcript on Tuesday. What we found out was that Attorney General Lynch basically said, we're not going to indict. Uh, there's nothing here for Clinton because we've changed the standard of the law. This is what amazed me in the Department of Justice under uh, President Obama. They took the standard out of the law and said, we're not, we don't believe we can ever do anything with gross uh, negligence, so we're just not going to charge it. And that's what they did. That's, so in April and May, before uh, Ms. Lynch decided to have an infamous meeting on a tarmac with a former president and then take herself out of the prosecutorial side, she had already put down the, the rule that we're not going to go here even before Ms. Clinton was ever interviewed. And by the way, also in this Lisa Page transcript, we also find out that even they could not understand, the FBI couldn't understand why they were doing, going against their own departmental policies when allowing key fact witnesses to sit in on uh, these interviews. And not, by the way, not transcribing them. And speaking of not transcribing, my chairman has a, an affinity for a former acting attorney general. Not sure why, except he's trying to find something on the president. So he brought him back in yesterday. And what was frustrating for me was as we sat in there and he went through many, many questions. The one thing that came out, as Chairman Adler said, you know, Mr. Whitaker, our fears were not realized. You did not do anything that we thought you may do, number one. So he admitted Whitaker didn't do anything to interfere with the investigation, to interfere with anything else. He admitted that. But then took and went out to the press and actually said in a statement that Mr. Whitaker made, he said, well, the question was, is, did you ever discuss U.S. attorneys? Which an, an attorney general would do that. He goes out to the, Mr. Nadler goes out to the press and implies that he talked about removing uh, U.S. attorneys 
including in his implication was the Southern District of New York and other places, that was just a falsehood. You answering from the affirm from the negative. We had to clear that up. My two in the room were much better than their two in the room, and we cleared that up yesterday. So as we look forward, this is just going to be a fight in the house. We're going to continue. And as I just was off the floor this morning, I want you to know, I want you to know from our side of the house, taxpayer dollars were well spent this morning. The Democrats put forward a resolution, restated the regulations from the Department of Justice that said that Mr. that the report from the Attorney General should release everything that he should legally he should legally be allowed to to re report. And they put that in a four or five page resolution, and that's what our rule bill was for the week. I sat there this morning and I said, I really don't know why we're here. And the sad part about it was, is all of them's talking points. We hope the Republicans will go on with this. I told them on Monday night, we're going to vote for this because it says nothing except a first-year law student's understanding of what the regulations say. <laughs> if this is where we're going in the House, we got a long road ahead of us. So that's where we're at right now. So I want to get right to your, your questions, uh, but because our time is brief, I really am going to insist no speeches, <laughs> one or two sentences, end it with a question mark. Uh, we will have a microphone, which we will hand uh, to you, so start to put your hands up. In the meantime, I'll ask the first, uh, the first question, which is, uh, so, uh, so Congressman, 81 subpoenas have, have gathered, and so Congressman Nadler, seems to be looking at anybody who has been involved in Trump world at any time in any of his business dealings, including, of course, long before he ever even thought about running for president. Is there, are there any limits on this that, that should exist or that you can enforce? They've, at this point in time, we're pointing out the fact, I mean, I didn't know Jerry Nadler was such a fisherman. I really didn't. I mean, but he's cast an amazing net here. I'll invite him down to the ocean or to my lake that I live on and let him catch bass because... This is just crazy in the sense of sitting at 81 letters. Two of them, by the way, they broke it up. Only 30. Oh, here's what they're doing. They're also hedging their bet on Mueller. Because 30, only 30 of those actually had to do with Russia, which was pretty interesting in here. Two of them were the president's personal attorney. I'd love to see the letter they got back from those two um, on what they're going to get. But this is what we're seeing. It's just they're casting it out there. Anything that's, any of you actually ever shook the president's hand? Anybody, anybody, I'm, I'm being serious. It's okay to raise your hand. This is not Baptist Church. We're okay. We're good. Uh, you may be getting a letter. Be careful. <laughs> I don't know. But that's what we're seeing. And, and so far, what we have heard is there's very, very little response. But I will say this. The chairman did say yesterday that probably next month we'll start looking at who sent in. And subpoenas will be on their way. Okay. Hands up. Give me. I can be here. I don't think that microphone's on, by the way. Um, how very angry the American people are when they're at Trump rally screaming, lock her up. They mean it. We see a two-tiered justice system that allows people with immense federal crimes to walk free and prosper where we would go to jail. Do you think, either of you, that by 20, before the election, we will see an indictment of anybody. You know, we know what Mr. Strzok did. Are we any, are the American people going to go to 2020 with that anger? Or will we see any indictments? Well, I'm not into anger management. I'm, uh, <laughs> so, you vote. <laughs> if you think this matters, vote. What you deserve is the facts. I'm not a prosecutor, so I'm not going to have an investigation that result in an indictment. Grassley and I referred several people uh, to the Justice Department to be looked at. We got a new Attorney General. I think he's desirous to regain the reputation. So you got, uh, I think it's Mr. Huber from mm -hmm. uh, Utah, who's acting as a quasi special counsel. You got Mr. Horowitz, who's going to look at a uh, IG view of the FISA process. We're going to look at it. I think the Attorney General is going to look at it. And we'll let the chips fall where they may. But I think the main thing that people are upset about is that we're just looking at one part of 2016. And end with this. 
if the shoe were on the other foot, you had an FBI agent and a DOJ lawyer who hated Clinton, wanted Trump to win, reverse the facts. Clinton, uh, mm-hmm. Trump comes in, sits down, hey, how you doing, interview. The Republican Party had paid for a foreign agent to go to Russia to get a dossier on Clinton. It proved to be a bunch of garbage. Somebody told them it was a bunch of garbage, and they got four different warrants on somebody associated with the Clinton campaign. What have we just learned? The double standard in the media. Mm -hmm. This would be front page news 24 hours a day, and the only place you can find this is here and at Fox. And that, to me, is very sad. Yeah. It is. And it did follow up, and that's why I'm releasing transcripts. That's why we're going through this process. And, and Strzok, I released Peter Strzok's today. So you go to, our, to my Twitter page uh, and find that. But it, Peter Strzok's got released today. We're seeing, and the reason we're doing this is not just simply to get it out there for transparency. Is I want to help, and we're tag teaming us because he, he has the ability with a gavel. I don't. Yeah, he's so a lot. this is what we're going to do. And what we're seeing is just a, a you know a, a setup that was set from one a political agenda and just went right down the line. And everything we're seeing is, is outlined in these transcripts, and we're seeing it. <clears throat> down here. Oh, yes. Uh, Mr. Graham, are you aware of a key part of the China situation that is, while America has weakened, drastically weakened the rights of inventors, China has actually strengthened those rights, which, are, which is allowing China to attract capital and to be threatening America for future technology development? Uh, yeah, well, I can't say I know every detail, but the Intellectual Property Subcommittee, as uh, Chris Coons and Tillis, mm-hmm. uh, the, the Chinese Economic Espionage Act is going to be one of the centerpieces of what we do, is one, to stop them to the extent that they're abusing our laws, the immigration laws, and and making them pay a, a higher price for it's certainly easier to steal somebody's idea than it is to generate your own. So, but I don't know if that answers your question, but that's my view of China. That's a, yeah, and that's something from my perspective. You, you want to know what elections matter, and you said that a few minutes ago. What? If you want intellectual property taken back up in the United States House, we need to get out and make sure that that message is in 2020. Because that's that would be the f- absolute first thing on my agenda is the intellectual property side. Because we have you re- you really you lose protections on patent, you lose VC, you lose the capital, you lose the ideas, you lose that, then we're going to fall behind in their inventions. They're sitting on the moon because of stolen. And, and product. one thing about and uh, we got to go, but Facebook, Google, all this stuff. And I got a flip phone, so I'm a fair guy to decide all this. Uh, <laughs> breaks down in three parts. Do you know what you're getting, signing up for? Is it really free? Basically, they're selling you. Behavioral advertising, they're, 90% of all the advertising money in the world, I think, goes to two companies. So the internet, uh, social media has been enriching our lives, but there's a dark side to it. So the privacy area is gonna be addressed so that the consumer can better understand what's happening and give you some control of how much of your life is shared because you want to have a question answered on Google or do you want to talk to somebody's grandkid. Uh, the other thing is content. A lot of conservatives believe that the people policing content do not share your values. That these are virtual monopolies, maybe monopolies by choice, but taking down radical thought, uh, there's really no guidelines to that. How you set up the algorithm, somebody needs to look at that. Uh, when it comes to taking down content, uh, is there a bias in the system? I think most of us believe there is. The last thing is how these systems can be hijacked by foreign powers and terrorist groups. And we have got to deal with all this. One example about the intellectual property. If you Google tomorrow, say Green Book, it won the Academy Award, they'll push you to a site where you can watch it for free. Now, Google is not intending for that to happen, I suppose, but a neutral platform that can be a criminal, be hijacked by a criminal enterprise is something we've got to look at. If you're worried about protecting intellectual property, music and movies, for example, and you've got one of these search engines that can direct you to a site that is stole it, then we need to deal with that.
Senator Graham, uh, Lamia from Al Jazeera. Are you planning to take extra steps against Saudi Arabia after yesterday's vote regarding the killing of uh, the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi and specifically against MBS himself? Right. Any um, sanctions, anything like yeah. that? So uh, from my point of view, I was a, the Saudi alliance is strategically important. I've been on the floor virtually by myself at times with Senator McCain saying, I know it's not a perfect place by any means, but we need to preserve the relationship. They're a bulwark against uh, Iran. They share information intelligence-wise, very important. And I actually introduced MBS a couple of years ago now, maybe less, at the 25th anniversary of the ending of the first Gulf War. They honored Senator McCain, and I spoke, and you know, I really was all in for MBS. He was talking about changing the culture, letting women drive, all good stuff, right? And along comes this. The Yemen War Powers Act, I've never believed that the War Powers Act was constitutional. If Congress doesn't like what a commander in chief's doing, cut off the funding. You can't have 535 commander in chiefs. Having said that, I believe MBS was complicit. It could not possibly happen without him knowing giving his behavior toward other people, including Mr. Khashoggi, it fits a profile. He imprisoned the Lebanese prime minister and basically did a hostage video. He woke up one morning and had a quarantine against Gutter, and we have about 12,000 troops. We're in a war in Yemen with no end, and it goes on and on and on, and it crescendos with the brutal murder and dismemberment of an American resident with four American children who was an opinion writer for the Washington Post who was slaughtered because he wrote something the guy didn't like. That's too much for me. I want a good relationship with Saudi Arabia, but not at all cost. We do business with bad people all over the world. That's just what you have to do. But if you're going to be a strategic ally, you need to act differently. And I think this is a defining moment for the Mideast. If we give this guy a pass, who do we say? What do we do in the future? So there will be sanctions that I will support against MBS. I'm not telling Saudi Arabia who to pick as their leader. I'm telling Saudi Arabia that if you're going to be a strategic ally of the United States, this won't cut it. And finally, it's disrespectful. President Trump has been terrific to Israel. He's been engaging the Arabs. He's opened up doors. I've tried my best to help the kingdom. This is not a good way to be repaid. I've got to go. Thank you all. Well, um, since Congressman Collins is, is kind enough to stay here, he also has a, a flight to catch, uh, but we'll take a couple of more questions. We had one right over here. We can talk about the Senate now. <laughs> Uh, so with regard to uh, the, the border wall getting built, obviously the route of going the emergency uh, declaration is problematic at best. Are there other methods that may accomplish that building that we're not being told of or that people have thought of it just hasn't reached a crescendo yet? There were really more up until, you know, January when the House flipped. I think that's going to become – it's an interesting problem to have. I, number one, on the, on the declaration itself, I, something the senator just said, and he and I actually talked about this walking in, if we want to change the law – this is what Congress does. If we want to change the law, we need to change the law instead of just making statements about what we don't like. We've done this so much. We do it with marijuana. We've done it with so much. We just say, well, let's just make DOJ not enforce this, but instead of dealing with the underlying law. The same thing is true here. The president, from a statutory, not a constitutional, but a statutory authority, has the authority to do this. You may not like it, and that's fine. I get that. It's not a policy question. It's a political question. And unfortunately, I believe the Senate is making it, and Republicans in the Senate are making a mistake um, by voting you know, for this dissolution resolution. Because, again, if you want to fix this, then work with the president to change the, the, the statute, not work on this other side. Working with the border wall itself is going to be, I think, more difficult because what we have found is folks that I've dealt with in the, from the Democratic side who voted for border wall money, who voted for it, has now became with a new generation coming in that it is a moral wrong. I, I just have a question for you here. If, uh, for me, 
abortion is murder. Abortion is a is a moral wrong. I'm not going to change my if, if I want to see it, it done away with. I'll see it done away with. A moral wrong of a border wall. If you're going to say a wall is immoral, then take down the existing walls. Few of them have actually been honest enough to say so. Beto or several of them said, "Yep, take down the rest of." I don't know what they're planning to do with that, but they've at least been honest about it. Almost entire House leadership. Most of the members of the Democratic Party who've been here any length of time have voted for border security and border wall money, including under the Obama administration and others. But because the political rhetoric has gotten to such a fevered pitch, they now cannot even have honest conversation. You know, they say, well, let's do technology and all this other stuff. As I told a lady on a, a telephone town hall the other night, technology cannot come down and put their hands on you. They can watch you go across. And she got really mad at me because she, cause she would preface her question by saying, well, I have a camera in my front yard and I have one in my backyard. I know who is there. And I said, and ma'am, I agree with you, but I bet you still lock your door at night. That's not what I'm talking about. I said, now we're done. So... That's, but that's where we're at. I think there's going to be some ways. It'll be smaller increments of money. But in this case, I think we're going to get a lot built, and we'll see where it goes from there. Last question over here. You mentioned criminal justice reform. It's yes. called the First Step Act. Can yes. you tell us what the second step to that would be? Well, I'll tell you what it's not, and that's what Mr. Booker's trying to make the Next Step Act. Um, and this, Hakeem Jeffries and I started this work uh, a while back, and there's things now that we can begin. We've actually opened the door to what I believe, and I've said many, many times, for conservatives, and especially for those of us who look at it, uh, I believe that the conservative message is absolutely the best message for people, for not only from a financial standpoint, but also from a moral and, and what is right standpoint. We're the ones that actually believe in people. We're the ones that actually believe that people have an inherent right gifted by God to do what they can do and that we're to stay out of that except to help where we can as a government should. So if we lay that out and we don't allow the, the liberal side to take the message of is that we've got to uh, you know, let everybody free, make every, all drugs free, you know, everything, take that message as long as we stick to what we have in, started in the first step back. You know, working on our sentencing form, making sure that we take and figure out why people come into the prisons to start with and how we can begin to get them out for recidivism rates. So that leads us into the next step. I sponsored a bill with uh, Chairman Cummings in the House that is in is, uh, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Booker on the other side about banning the box on a federal level and federal contracts. I think that's a great first step. It still doesn't allow uh, someone to get a job or, or hide the fact that they've had a criminal uh, history, but it does get them past the first stage, and then then after that, they can decide if they want to or not, because we have to give people a second chance in this if they want to. If they don't want it, then we have prisons that they can go back to. So this is something we can look at. Other things that we're going to be looking at is expungement you know, laws that where we can, you know, especially for the younger offenders, take those off their records. Then we also can continue looking at uh, reasonable ways to deal with sentencing reforms and also the mandatory minimum issue that we have in this country. I spoke to the uh, uh, justices over at the Supreme Court. The uh, court uh, had, had their judicial administrative folks come in. And I talked to them the other day and I said, for the first time, and this was sort of underreported in the First Step Act, is for the first time there's been at least a move again to give reasonable uh, discretion back to judges in this sense. Now, from a concern that, that does bother me, and there, there's something I have to be concerned about, but not really when we look at what we're doing, especially when given the fact that we can put parameters in place but give reasonable accommodations to uh, judicial discretion. And I think now with what the senator's doing and, the, and the, the Senate's doing, putting judges in place, especially on the district court level and moving forward, that's where that discretion is so uh, genuinely needed. And we've had such a broad coalition helping on that. That's been the next step. So those are the kind of areas, some sentencing reform, the expungement area, the uh, ban the box, and again, continuing that process. And then also oversight uh, of the First Step Act's actual inclusion. So it's a great thing. We're continuing to look forward to it. Congressman, thank you for thank being you so here. Much. And thank you all for coming. <laughs> Thank you.